This is Partner Relationship Management, the ultimate channel sales podcast. Welcome to another episode of the Ultimate Channel Sales Podcast. I'm your host, Paul Bird. How does a private equity takeover typically impact a company's strategic direction and how it can affect their channel partner program? Sometimes channel partner programs get the ax when a PE firm takes over. In today's episode, we'll explore this issue, investigate the underlying reasons, and discuss strategies to protect your channel program from being eliminated during a private equity takeover. As usual, feel free to follow along with the transcript or easily replay sections with our chapter markers. Our guest today has been in the channel space for more than 21 years. His expertise includes POTS transformation as a service, and if you're not familiar with the term POTS, that stands for plain old telephone service, Uh, SD-WAN, SASE, and mobility solutions. In his most recent role as director of channel sales at Spectrotel, he was their very first sales hire and grew their channel department to more than 15. Today, he's with us to talk about how you can take over proof your channel program from private equity. Please welcome David Sherman. Welcome to the show, David. It's great to have you here. Thank you, Paul. Pleasure to be here. Appreciate the opportunity. Perfect. So why don't you tell us a little bit of some of the highlights in your career in the channel so far? Yeah, so it's been uh, it's been a great ride without a doubt. Uh, definitely always evolving, always growing as we see additional partners um, and vendors and suppliers continue to join join the race, the race to the bottom in, in many instances. Uh, as we see the prices going um, and, you know, more data uh, requirements for the companies across the board. But it's been a wonderful ride, Um, a lot of growth, a lot of mergers, acquisitions, and and now private equity getting into the mix. And each one of those, you know, have their own pros and cons associated with them. So it's, I've have pretty diverse background. I've worked for that local incumbent carrier, kind of the um, you know, the AT&Ts of Verizon to the world. I do have some cable experience uh, with nodes and head ends. Uh, I have worked for a smaller facilities-based carrier, so I'm familiar with switching and networking and NNIs and things of that nature, uh, and then been, um, you know, in the channel space with a, a next-generation aggregator, uh, more of a global, you know, economy provider in, in the same space. But uh, each one of them, you know, bring along their own uh, their own opportunities, their own potential, um, and then some, you know, some downsides that can come along with each of those as well. For sure. So, what do you enjoy the most about being a director of channel sales? It's definitely developing relationships, partnerships, uh, you know, nurturing those engagements, and helping customers save money ultimately is is really the goal um or plan for optimization digital transformations um to improve their business processes and you know uh increase profitability long term for sure any plans uh, coming up for yourself what's uh, next for for you and your career yeah so it's interesting yes that director of channel sales has been my title for the past uh it would be 16 years I have personally uh, just accepted a VP channel development role in in the similar space, uh, more of a boutique firm, but with a global reach uh, and many more products and services to offer um, so that there's really no opportunity that's too large or too small, nothing that you have to walk away from, um, but still have the ability to take advantage of those partner engagements and customers as well of, of all sizes. So, Well, congratulations. So let's get into uh, today's discussion on private equity takeovers. So how does a private equities firm takeover typically impact a company's strategic direction? And how do you feel it can affect their channel partner program? Well, it can definitely affect it in many ways, without a doubt. Uh, we've seen it run, you know, run its course, and in many other companies where this has taken place, 
Um, and in some cases, it can it can kind of fuel the fire and lend them additional resources and capabilities, uh, the ability to improve their product set and their portfolio uh, for their customers and vendors. In other instances, um, it could be eliminated completely or changed um, to the point where it's no longer the same program at all. Um, and, you know, it uh, could be through adopting different platforms. It could be through, um, you know, pricing changes that take place, especially in private equity where, you know, those investment bankers, they really want to make their money back in a shorter period of time. Uh, sure. A, you know, traditional mindset for that business owner. Um, and in many instances, there are going to be other changes that take place, uh, whether that be on timeframes uh, for things to get done, whether it be on commission structures for both, you know, internal employees as well as agents and, and partners out in the field. Uh, and it could be just based on relationships with suppliers and or vendors, uh, especially in private equity. Um, in many instances, that new ownership could own or have have hands in you know multiple companies in the same space. And again, that can bring along its own positive and negative attributes. So future. if we look at if the you know investment firm decides to keep the partner programs, what other ways do they bring about change to it? Is there effect on the channel leadership team? Uh, is there kind of a, additional changes that they typically um, try to make that you can kind of fight against a little bit? What uh, what do you see when they decide to keep it? When they decide to keep it, they usually try to keep it at the same or lower cost, which in some cases for the partners can be detrimental because they've you know built this uh, customer base over time. In, in many cases, a residual commission. Um, that is their lifeblood in addition to, you know, what are considered one-time spiffs or, or bonuses for the business they bring to us, like a finder's fee. Um, but not all uh, equity firms um, want to continue paying uh, in that vein. Um, now, these are 1099 employees for the most part that mm -hmm. own their production, but uh, sometimes it, it may be looked at as easier to pull the plug on those type of programs than it is on direct internal employees uh, that might be looked at more negatively uh, as a layoff or, you know, uh, something that could potentially drive down uh, share pricing. So almost get, lit get rid of the, the long-term residuals and uh, kind of focus on, on net new or, or uh, land and expand. Yeah. Um, and then, you know, also what you see in some cases is that the internal employees that uh, have the loyalty, the longevity, and have produced the most, which are most often getting paid the most, um, could potentially be in a position where replacement could become an option, or they might look at it as, um, you know, the freedom to hire five or six new people for the same price that they pay one or two today. So those are those are all on the table. Um, and you see uh, you see that happen in, in many different instances across the board, especially within the past, you know, five to ten years. So in your experience, are there some common reasons that a that an investment firm might cancel or significantly restructure a partner program kind of post takeover? If they feel that there are other ways to generate that same business and or expand on it at a lower cost, that would be the main reason. It goes back to the fact that, you know, they might look at one particular relationship or partnership uh, where they're paying, you know, thousands uh, upon thousands of dollars per month for business that has already been in the pipeline and, and active in some cases for years. because of these um, original agreements carried evergreen clauses where the partners would get paid for the life of the customer. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, unfortunately, once a private equity firm comes in, they may have a little bit more flexibility and, and leeway on what they choose to keep in place going forward. In some cases, those clauses get pushed by the wayside 
um, along with those residual commissions, which have grown to significant figures over years and years. Are there other performance metrics that are often evaluated uh, by a, a private equity firm to determine the effectiveness of a partner program? And are they really looking at the right metrics uh, or is there kind of a flawed analysis in a lot of cases? I think in many cases there's, you know, uh, I, I would hesitate to call it flawed analysis because when you're talking about private equity, you're talking about investment bankers and that financial that they bring to their position is is the reason that they're there. So it's not necessarily flawed, um, but by the same token, they're not necessarily concerned with past production, relationships, loyalty, uh, you know, time and service, things of that nature, which, um, you know, are, are generally looked at favorably, at least during the period uh, when you're building relationships and, and building a business. From an entrepreneurial mindset, which is a little bit different than the investment banking side. Do you think that they should really take those uh, metrics into consideration, or are there other metrics that that maybe are not as uh, cut and dry? Something that you can kind of put on a balance sheet so they get a, a more accurate picture of uh, of the operation of the business. I think they could definitely be taken into consideration, but that would extend uh, the lead time on them making their you know, making their revenues back. So uh, a lot of times with private equity, they're going to want to make back their investment, you know, within a two to three year period in a perfect world. And sometimes they may overpay uh, for uh, an organization and it could take them longer. But if they, if they keep the business running the exact same way that it was when they came in, uh, there's no doubt that that's going to be an extended period optimize themselves and and try to run a little bit leaner in order to get those monies back in a more favorable position as quickly as possible. So we talked about kind of the elimination of uh, kind of the, the high priced employee as well as the kind of residuals. Are there some other cost cutting measures that uh, that, you know, investment firms tend to take that could also impact the uh, the partner program? There are definitely others. Um, you know, we've seen in some instances where companies will pride themselves on 24-7, 365 support, and that's the way that they've built their programs in the past. Uh, that may not be looked at as favorably by an investment firm that has to pay people to work 24-7, 365. Um, so it's interesting to, you know, to kind of see the the progression. Uh, that could take place in some instances where, you know, 7 a.m. to 7 p.m. Um, becomes much more favorable. And it, does it mean that you're eliminating those people completely? Uh, not necessarily, but you may be forcing them into a, a different environment or working hours that may not be as favorable or, or amenable uh, to them. So... You know, we've we've definitely seen that take place as well, where, you know, people may feel forced out of a position as opposed to laid off or fired. But again, those those salary adjustments work to improve the bottom line and help them make that money back quicker. For sure. So let's look at the flip side of the coin on uh, programs that have flourished. I know that uh, through my career, one of the companies that I'd followed was Solar Winds, uh, and when private equity came into Solar Winds, that infusion of capital uh, really helped them create a more robust kind of partner support system and really kind of expanded their their reach. So, from your perspective, you know. How important is it for um, private equity to kind of enhance a partner program or maybe specialize uh, in a specific market or expand uh, a company's reach? Do you think that uh, from the, the flip side of the coin where somebody's flourishing that they can make a big impact? Sure. I think there are definitely positives that can come from that as well. Additional resources is one right off the bat. Um, you know, if, if you're a, a multi-million dollar company uh, and you're um, acquired essentially by a, a billion dollar company, there's going to be more flow around. Um, you can fill holes. You can, you know, bring on additional employees that you may not have had that same flexibility in the past. And you can also look at, you know, additional products, services, uh, support functions that, 
may have been a need in the past that you just didn't have the wherewithal or the resources to uh, to fill. Uh, so yeah, there there are absolutely positives. Uh, there could be the ability to bring on additional products uh, in into and add to a portfolio as well that you may not have had um, the interest or or resources to attack in the past or as quickly. They may have been a roadmap item for the end of the year that get pushed up uh, to the beginning because they have high margin and are more favorable products. The other thing that we've seen is the, you know, the adoption of artificial intelligence. Mm -hmm. So utilize that to your advantage um, and create a better customer experience, then ultimately that's going to be a positive for your customers and, and that agent engagement as well. So if you can get, you know, quicker answers to the phone, quicker uh, answers to support or trouble tickets or, you know, billing questions, things of that nature. Um, and there is an AI functionality that can be brought into place. Um, yes, there's a one time or, you know, essentially an upfront cost, but in theory, that AI generation is, is learning each day and it's mm -hmm. learned from your business processes and the support functions and responses it sees passing through the system. So it should be able to do more uh, in an automated fashion each day, each week, each year, potentially eliminating, you know, either some positions or, you know, giving you the ability to cut back on some salaries that are paid today. For sure. I'm glad you brought up customers um, because I'm wondering about the effect, you know, you've got an equity firm that has taken over a company that, that they work with. They've got a good, strong relationship with a partner. Are there any kind of potential uncertainty that brings into a customer's mind where they might have to evaluate the risk of uh, the, you know, losing that relationship with the partner or maybe, you know, they're concerned about maybe they'll switch vendors because they're no longer going to be working with a partner. I mean, we've seen this with uh, uh, organizations like VMware that just killed their channel program or sorry, not killed it, but significantly narrowed the focus. But what about the the impact on kind of the mentality, the, the thought from a customer perspective, uh, if there's that uncertainty, if they're still going to be working with that partner or not? Yeah, depending depending on what the relationship is between the customer and the carrier, uh, mm -hmm. channel engagement, there's still a question mark because they don't know if that partner is going to continue to be paid on the account. Uh, they may not have been aware that the partner is being paid to begin with on the account, mm -hmm. but the relationship that they have, uh, you know, with that partner, um, in most cases, you would think they want to stay intact. And if that partner is no longer being paid on the account, then their willingness to continue to service and support that same customer may be diminished. Um, so yeah, it's it's definitely a concern. We've had questions come up during initial, you know, um, pre-sales meetings or um, customer engagements for demos or trainings or quotes, where that question has definitely been asked. So if a, if a firm comes in, they acquire a company, and it's a really well-managed partner program, um, and they decide they're going to the, keep it uh, post-takeover, is there kind of an effective partner management strategy that, that they should put into, in, in place, given that you know, this is a really high-performing, maybe they're 100% through channel, uh, and it, uh, you know, they decide to keep it because it's, it's so well-managed, but is there kind of um, you know, a an approach in how they'll value that program and the importance of maintaining its current structure uh, because it's performing so well. Yeah, so it, when you when you purchase a company that's 100% channel focused and channel driven, then you really have no choice um, for the most part, but to keep that, that channel strategy intact and the leadership as well, uh, because they're the ones that are driving you know, the revenue partnerships, the engagements, um, the supplier relationships as well. Um, whereas if you're dealing with a carrier that has both a direct sales component as well as the channel, then you could potentially have a choice to make. Um, or you're both intact, but that you know brings along its own uh, kind of internal issues as well. But yeah, a lot of it depends on what the initial strategy was and you know what that mindset was going in on how to build the business or the best 
best way to go about it. So what would you say are the most important aspects of kind of managing partner relationships or managing your channel that you know the head of channel or the director of channel would need to prove out uh, to the equity firm to let them know this is a you know a high performing program. Are there any specific aspects or any tools that you can use to help? I would say it's month over month increase in revenues, um, which show that it's a productive it's a productive platform. It's a productive strategy. You're always building you know new relationships and bringing on new logos in addition to the cross sell and upsell opportunities that come from the existing customer base as well. Um, as long as you're bringing on new products and services uh, and enhancing those capabilities, then there should always be additional upsell revenue as well. And it's really just maintaining that support structure and then being proactive. Uh, as far as renewals are concerned and, and really life cycle management and engagement uh, to stay on top of those opportunities as well. Uh, because in the channel environment and, and really telecom in general, the longer the customer stays with you, the more profitable their account becomes. Uh, and you're building out that infrastructure or renegotiating rates with underlying carriers. So it's really about building a long-term relationship both with your partner and with the customer as well. Now, does any of this advice change when it's a merger or acquisition? I don't know that the advice necessarily changes, but the the mindset or potentially the timeframes going into those engagements could differ. Uh, you know, merger is usually two like-minded uh, business owners that have something, some type of synergy or some common, you know, roadmap in place or future growth aspect where they either have a product that one is a specialty in and the other wants to get there or uh, they find that they have so many similar customers that there's a, a mutual a mutual benefit um, you know to that engagement the acquisition is a little bit different just because it could be you could look at it going in as the same mindset but generally one company is going to be much larger than the other as opposed to just like-minded individuals of maybe similar size and then you also have to determine you know are you going to keep multiple people in multiple departments mm -hmm. that are shared i mean do you really need two hr departments uh now that it's one company um integration of systems are you using the same operating systems the same order processing same accounts payable softwares and, and apps and capabilities. Um, are you going to adopt best practices from, from one and, and not the other? Uh, and then are you going to top grade at certain positions and allow others to kind of fall off? So there's, there's a lot that goes into it in both mergers and acquisitions. The recommendations are going to remain the same. I mean, ultimately, uh, they're capitalism, they're in business to make money and they want to make the most that they can on on each partner engagement or customer engagement, really, when it comes down to it. Absolutely, I, I've seen this with companies that uh, that I've worked with in the in the very recent uh, uh, past, where you know uh, two companies come together. You know, they both have head of channel, and actually, the uh, what happened was the the company that was acquired uh, that person became the head of channel, and the person that was head of channel they got promoted. So. It was kind of they were keeping the best parts of all the organizations, but I know that when I talk to people on the uh, the kind of the back office side of things, uh, that merger or acquisition becomes a nightmare because exactly they're you know bringing multiple systems together, and uh, that that can be a lot of work if they're doing you know multiple acquisitions uh, within a, a really short period of time. Sure. Yeah, the the integration is key, and and quite honestly, that's also the you know the the largest downfall. I mean, without without naming names or disparaging any company, is it the you know those that have multiple uh, mergers and acquisitions under that one umbrella uh, usually have the most difficult time if it's not managed properly up front, um, and we see that on a on a daily, weekly, monthly basis just with vendors and suppliers that you know that we utilize daily that may have gone through that uh, 
over time. And you, you can't always integrate every system. In some cases, we've also seen adoptions or acquisitions where, um, you know, a company will buy a certain region, a certain footprint, a certain locality uh, because they want to um, get into that market. But what they find is that they don't have any employees with the expertise uh, to run those products and services. Um, so now they're left in a kind of a lurch where they have to pay the company that they bought, <laughs> do some consulting for them for a period of time to bring them up to speed on what they actually just purchased. Uh, and that happened before too. It's, it's just kind of crazy. Yeah, I, I have seen that uh, before as well. So from your perspective, what can typically go wrong with uh, channel programs on the mergers and acquisition side as opposed to the private equity takeover? On the merger and acquisition side, it could be that these two companies share the same agents and partners already. So they think that they're getting additional revenues when the truth is that they may be cannibalizing. Um, mm -hmm from that other party and there may not be a huge benefit from it but there's still going to be additional products in the portfolio there's still going to be additional solutions and additional revenues out of the gate it's just that that growth uh may not be as great as they anticipated if there's a lot of shared partners in the space and you know technology uh, although it's a global economy it's still a small world um in the technology space that's very, very true. So as we start to wrap up, can you share any insights or tips for vendors who are currently going through either a merger acquisition or a private equity takeover, and they're worried about losing their partner program? Yeah, I would say, you know, definitely learn everything that you can definitely, you know, stay on top of and read about the, you know, the company that's coming in and acquiring and or merging or, or purchasing you outright. Um, stay on your toes, uh, be, be open to, you know, new opportunities and, and have your resume up to date, uh, just be safe, um, and do your due diligence. I mean, go out there and look at, um, the largest competitors in your market, uh, find out what they're doing and, you know, what they've gone through in the past, take a peek at, you know, the past mergers, acquisitions and, and private equity takeovers within the past year uh, in your market as well. It, it, it's interesting. We, um, you know, in my prior position, we have an annual review in December of each year. And December of 2023, part of what we had to bring to the table uh, as a group were uh, reviews of our competitors. Um, and it's great because you're learning about, you know, what, what their product set is, uh, what they do well and what they don't do, and kind of gives you a holistic view of that entire market uh, and or industry or or base of competitors in the space. But it's it's also interesting in that you know you know you know where to go and look, and you know who's doing things right and who may you know may not be at the top of their game um, or who's faltering. Um, because you learn that as well within the feedback that's received. So what is the best place to uh, stay up to date with trends in, in kind of your market? Uh, is there anything that you recommend in the channel space? Well, uh, obviously adoption of, you know, uh, LinkedIn and, and different groups and, and partnerships uh, that are available on there. There's a wealth of information available. Um, certainly industry and events, um, channel partners and ITC and channel connect, what have you, uh, there's a wealth of those available as well. And really, um, you know, staying on top of all, um, networking, networking capabilities and engagements, you know, I'd be remiss to just offer one. There are so many out there and, and available to, um, including, uh, you know, including podcasts as well, uh, which there are a ton of. Uh, Absolutely. All right, David. Well, thanks so much for being a guest on the show today. It's really been a pleasure to have you here. Thank you, Paul. Truly appreciate it. Wish you all the best. Have a great summer. Thank you.
All right, guys, thank you for listening to the Ultimate Channel Sales Podcast. Please don't forget to join us next time. For more information, please visit channelsalespodcast.com. If you haven't already, please like and subscribe to our podcast. And if you enjoyed this episode today, please leave us a five-star rating. From the Apple Podcast app, just select our show, scroll down to the rating and review section, and click write review. And don't forget to share with your friends or professional network, anyone who'd enjoy it. See you next time on the Ultimate Channel Sales Podcast.